Listen now as the CEO of Stairwell, Mike Wysuck, details a new vision for cyber resilience that will revolutionize the cybersecurity industry. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us here today. Um, I'm going to talk about cyber resilience and uh, our vision for it. So I'm going to say, let's start at the end of the presentation first. And the two things that I would like everyone to take away in this talk is the concept of evasion-resistant security and then what AI-powered cyber resiliency actually looks like. So let's just start with something spicy. Cybersecurity sucks. It's practically a failed industry. Like, there's so much snake oil. Right, right, right now in San Francisco, the RSA conference is going on. And there are about, I think, 1,400 booths of uh, vendors selling their unique take on everything. And um, they all suffer some severe problems. And I'm going to kind of talk about that. But I want to say the, the quiet part out loud. People have called security Sisyphean, right? As you're pushing this boulder up the hill eternally, and every time you get near the top, it rolls back down over you, it hurts, and you reset, and you do it all over again. Um, Cybersecurity is even worse than that in my mind, because anyone watch cartoons when you were younger, and you see like, you know, Bugs Bunny rolls a snowball down a hill, and it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger until it's the size of a school bus and runs over Yosemite Sam. Like, you've all been there. You've seen that. Security is the opposite. We're pushing this boulder up the hill, and it's getting larger as we go up because it's collecting more and more craft. Doesn't make any sense to me. Look at the list of all of the things that we buy to try and keep ourselves safe, right? We got firewalls. We got IDSs. We got EDRs. We got EPPs, we got CASBs, we got SIMs, we got MDMs, MFMs, MFAs, blah, 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 HBO, at and uh, But why? Why do we buy all of this stuff? Why are, why are our IT security budgets just growing to the point we don't even know if we're getting value from the money we're spending? Well, we buy it because they say so. What do I mean by that? At some point in time, I don't even know when, um, compliance started taking over for what I would call actual security. If you talk with people, they'll ask, are you FedRAMP? Are you, do you have SOC 2? Do you have ISO 27001, 27001, and so on and so forth? Uh, PCI, HIPAA, all these things. Compliance does not equal security. Compliance just means you're compliant. You've done what they told you. The real question is, where does security happen? And for a lot of organizations, it doesn't happen along the compliance journey. Um, everyone know when you make a password for a website or some app, it's like you must be, you know, at least 300 characters long and have exclamation points and uppercase and lowercase and Swahili characters in your password, you know, to make it safe. Did anyone know where that came from? As far as I can gather, it came from a book the DOD NSA published in 1984 called the Orange Book. It was the DOD Guide for Trusted Systems, and it had password complexity requirements in there. And so what you realize over time, these requirements never relax. They just grow, and they grow, and they grow, and they grow. And that's the boulder we're pushing up that hill that nobody wants to be the person to stand up and say, is what we're doing, does it make sense? And so what we devolve to in terms of cybersecurity is essentially checklists. We sit down and we have all these checklists and we just check boxes and we check boxes. And do you know who loves that? The bad guys. Because people don't go above and beyond. They do what they are required to do for compliance purposes. They don't do more. And since they don't do more, well, the tornado comes through and it doesn't really give a damn what our checklists happen to say. AT&T would breach, Change Healthcare, Wells Fargo, Wisconsin, Home Depot, Omni, Greylock McKinnon, Pentagon, Microsoft, all breached. Right. The really, really scary part was, this was in less than a seven-day window 
I didn't pick this date. I sat down when I learned I was going to give this talk. I just went to Google News and I searched for cyber breach. And this was over the last seven days. Question I ask myself, like, you know, I say cybersecurity is broken, almost a failed industry. Is this what winning looks like? Because I don't know what losing is. You know, we kind of stand up and we're like, last, last place. And you're just, it's almost kind of embarrassing that that's where we are. Hi, I'm Mike Wysak. It's good to introduce, to you, introduce myself to everybody. I wanted to get that out of the way before we kind of talk about um, what we're here to say. Some of my background, because I think uh, some people will tell, I was going to talk a little bit about uh, Operation Aurora here. I work for people, they have a table in this room, but I'm not allowed to talk about their name without their permission, and I'm way too lazy to go over and get it. So I work for them. Uh, I spent several years there and did stuff. Ultimately, I, uh, I left there and I went to go join this other company called Google. Um, they're over there. Actually, I think every single one of my employers is in this room right now, which is really kind of creepy. Um, but I went to go work for Google and uh, I was on the security team there and I was looking for bugs and vulnerabilities in our own products. Um, then one night, I was sitting down and I was eating a burrito. And this is where everything went haywire. So I'm sitting in this room and I'm eating a burrito. This is AI generated, it's not the real room, but it's pretty close. I'm eating this burrito and down the other end of the room, the door opens up and some uh, very high level executives walk in and they start talking about a uh, compromised machine. And I'm sitting there and I'm like, should I get up? Should I leave or should I stay? So I decide I'm just gonna sit there and stay. They didn't ask me to leave. And as I'm sitting there, just eating my burrito, reading my email, uh, one of them makes the comment that this is a probably a target of opportunity, no big deal. And I had enough alarm bells going off in the back of my head that screamed like, APT, nation state operation. This is really, really scary. This is a big deal. And um, I go over and I'm like, hey, hi, I think this is a big deal. And uh, they kind of jump out of their chairs and they say, who are you? How'd you get in this room? I said, uh, I'm Mike, and I was in the room before you came in. And they said, how much have you heard? And I said, everything. And uh, they said, wait, what do you mean? What do you mean nation state? And I said, oh, I used to work for a nation state, this one, but that sounds like a pretty scary thing. So they ultimately say, you know, like that becomes Operation Aurora. That was how I got wrapped into Aurora, uh, which was, you know, allegedly, uh, you know, people believe the Chinese government breaking into Google, ultimately leaving, leading Google to uh, pull business out of mainland China. So what started off was, you know, a handful of engineers in a room uh, with whiteboards and taking notes. And at this time, I often like to tell people, I think that Google was really good with cybersecurity. They were going above the compliance requirements. They've always had a tendency to over exceed um, in, in everything that they try and set out to do. But something was different about this. Like, I don't think Google in 2009, 2010 was what I would call a, like a hardcore security company. Um, but they were really, really good. The thing that made them, and we kind of learned on the ground, that made them great was Google logs everything. You, it, it, it is like, I, don't, I, I can't even think about, like it's an interview question I would ask people. It's like, how would you steal data from Google if I let you have access to my laptop? And as far as I could ever come up with in you know, 13 years I worked there, there was no answer because you can't. Everything, 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 everything is logged. And I think when the operators on the other end of this, uh, of the Operation Aurora came knocking, they didn't know that. And so it put us in a position where we could very quickly and within seconds understand what they were doing, how, where, and so forth, and, and literally digest all of that information down in a way that like, to this day, I don't think people actually uh, can truly appreciate. After Aurora was wrapped up, I went over to Google leadership and I proposed creating what I called the Threat Analysis Group, which was basically a group that would study how nation state uh, operators and sophisticated adversaries wish our users and ourselves uh, ill will. Uh, at this point in time, outside of the three letter agencies, there was nothing really like this in industry. And it was kind of an interesting uphill battle to go over and build that up, um, but we did. And when you sit down and you realize that you have like infinite compute and infinite storage and 
pretty much infinite resources, you can get to be pretty dangerous very quickly. I was at a meeting with DHS while I was running the threat analysis group, and it was a big deal because they wanted to share some indicators for some um, you know, nation state activity, and I went to go see what they had to say. And so we're sitting in this room, and they passed out a piece of paper that had you know, 10 domain names on it, and they said, these are like, we just got these declassified. This is something you need to be worried about. If you see any traffic to this on your network, you should get help. So everyone else in the room is sitting there and they're holding this paper like it's, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. And I'm looking at it, it's like, oh yeah, I know about all those. I've been following those for six months. Um, I think it's incomplete. And so I go pull up my laptop, I look on it, I look in our internal system and I'm like, yeah, there's another 10 you guys are missing. So I wrote them on a paper and I slipped it back to the FBI guy there and I said, you missed these. And he said, we haven't seen these before. How'd you, where'd you get these? And I'm like, uh, that's classified, I can't tell you. Um, so, you know, that felt really, really good. Um, but, you know, the question that I asked myself when that was done is how do other organizations outside of Google do this type of work? And the answer is, unfortunately, they just don't. So that uh, led to the entrepreneurial spirit in me, and I started a company within Alphabet called Chronicle. And Chronicle was an attempt to try and bring some of Google's data processing, log storage, and search capabilities to enterprises all around the world. Now, that was fun. Google ultimately ended up buying Chronicle and bringing it back into the Google Cloud umbrella. So if you go by the Google booth, you'll see stuff about Threat Analysis Group and Chronicle and all that type of stuff there. But the thing that I learned as I really went down the big rabbit hole of, of log storage was that, you know, logs are difficult. And I always told, they always felt incomplete to me when you think about the real value that they offer. When I, when I left, I believe we had over an exabyte of log data. That's a lot of, lot of data. It's really kind of hard to even visualize an exabyte. Even for, even for me, when that was the numbers we were working with, if you have a four terabyte hard drive, that's an exabyte. 250,000 four terabyte hard drives is one exabyte. That is a six foot tall human, and that is to scale. If we were to take those hard drives, each one is eight tenths of an inch thick, and stack them on top of each other one at a time. Anyone have any idea of how big that tower of hard drives would be? It would be 3.1 miles tall. That's 11.4 Empire State Buildings from sidewalk to the top of the antenna at the very top. 11.4 of them stacked up on top of each other. Think of the number of servers and the amount of power and wear and tear and backups and redundancy it requires just to have one exabyte. There are probably many, many exabytes at this point, but the issue that you realize is while logs are foundational security concepts, and it's really important to have them, they are expensive, incredibly expensive. There's a reason why Cisco bought Splunk, which was like a log storage uh, solution for I think $28 billion, like spends a fortune on this stuff. And the question is, do we actually get value out of it commensurate with what we're spending the money on? So I'm going to talk here a little bit about evasion-resistant security architecture. And uh, I like to use humor for a lot of stuff. So I showed you the slide before. is the stuff that we all buy. And on this slide, I actually say, this is the stuff they buy. They being the adversaries. They buy this software because they know that that's what we're using to protect ourselves. And they're going to tear it apart and understand exactly how it works. How many organizations, IT teams, will go out and buy a firewall, tear it apart, and figure out its weaknesses? None. The bad guys do, but the good guys don't. Which leads to a solution, a situation rather, where the bad guys know more about how our defenses work than we do. And that's absolutely insane. This is why cybersecurity is a failed field in my mind. It is like we decided we were going to build the best possible masonry fortress in the world and they just flew drones overhead. Or, this is my favorite slide in the entire deck, what if the Rebel Alliance was just able to buy the blueprints for a Death Star from a 7-Eleven vending machine? Kind of negates a plot of some of those movies, doesn't it? They still have to figure out where the weakness is, but when you have the blueprints for it, it kind of makes it a much easier problem. Let's take a little practice. Here's a dump uh, from Ida Pro of some uh, string references inside of a piece of malware. Uh, if you notice, you know we got. Let's, okay, we're going to see if this like little pointer thing works. We see strings for Kaspersky, 
all throughout there. And then you see strings for, uh, oh yeah, McAfee here. Anyone know what we're looking at? This is Stuxnet, you know, you know, came out in 2010, discovered sabotaging nuclear centrifuges in Iran. Um, reversing some of the code back to almost a C-like code. Uh, this Stuxnet was able to detect McAfee, Kaspersky, and other products on the systems it was trying to infect and alter its behavior so that it didn't get caught. The people who are trying to break in know how our defenses work better than we do. That's not evasion resistant. It's in fact, you are just falling victim to the same thing over and over and over again. If you want to be evasion resistant, you need to be asymmetrically unfair to the adversaries. We should be smarter than them no matter how hard they try. That's actually a tall order. If we're walking down the street and we find a uh, credit card and a $10 bill on the, on the ground, okay, yeah, you know, people are going to probably pick up the 10 bucks. Am I right? You know, probably pick it up, put it in your pocket, maybe buy a quarter of a Big Mac with it. You know, it's like prices are pretty high these days, but you're going to pick up the $10 and you're not going to probably feel bad about spending it. There's no risk to you. But if you picked up the credit card, who would actually go out and try and use the credit card? See, no one, no one's going to go out and use the credit card because the risk of actually ending up in handcuffs is non-zero. You can go out there and try and use that credit card to, you know, even buy a tank of gas. If it's stolen, the cops might show up. The credit card is asymmetrically unfair to you as the quote unquote bad guy in this situation. Systems should learn. They should learn constantly, but they should not give feedback to the attacker. Even if the attacker knows what we're doing, they should not be able to leverage that to benefit them. So what does this look like in practice? You know, one of my friends, he is a, uh, he's actually the CEO for Grok, who was over here yesterday. He had to leave today. But, you know, about a year ago, he came up to me and he said, aren't you afraid of AI-generated malware? And I looked at him and I said, no. And he says, you should be. And I'm like, no. And he said, why are you not? And I said, well, you know, it's because um, we're, we're evasion resistant. And he's like, what does that mean? And I said, like, we're not sitting there trying to quantify, like, this looks bad or this is, this is, this is, uh, this is good. Uh, we're beyond that. My goal is to make AI hackers, you know, look like destitute people sitting on the side of the street. I want to put them out of a job before they can even get started. One of the problems that you have, as you've heard the previous talk here, was talking about models and training and all this is that the reason why a lot of stuff is not resistant is we're training, everyone's training their models on the same data. You know, there's a, a company that, you know, Google owns called VirusTotal, and if you upload a file to VirusTotal, they will basically run it through 70 so on AV engines and they get a verdict back. The dirty little secret is most companies just train models on the compendium of all of those results. Not supposed to, but they do. And as they go over and they do that, what ends up happening is they all end up with a bias to the same decision, giving the same exact inputs. So if everyone's reading the same books and you're having a whole bunch of computers training on it, they're all going to essentially build roughly the same model that we're not actually stepping beyond what everyone is used to. This leads to a sea of conformity. You know, it leads to a ocean of everything looking identical, suburban sprawl, as far as the eye could see, every house with the exact same weak points, the same structural failures, because that's where we're pushing it. At Stairwell, my current company, the reason why I say we're evasion resistant is we have a pretty unique approach. We just collect and store everything for forever kind of hard. Like people say, what about AI? This, I'm like, no, nah, it doesn't matter. Like we take one copy of every executable file and driver and other such thing from every machine in an enterprise and we store it. We're literally building an enterprise-wide bespoke data lake consisting of exactly what's on every machine in one spot. That's where we do our training. That's where we're building AI detection and so on and so forth because it's actually unique to each company. Much like if you were to find a credit card on the ground and one said Mike and the other said Eric Schmidt on it, um, 
you could probably use his to buy something a lot more expensive than you're going to use to buy mine. Um, but the, but that's the challenge of it, right? It's bespoke, it's tailored, it's unique. So once I have a copy of everything, we've built all of the machine learning and all of the data processing systems to go back and constantly reevaluate the entirety of the history of an organization. What does that actually mean? Um, we may not know something is bad today. We may learn something is bad tomorrow, but that information never goes out of style. So once we learn something, once we learn something new or we learn new information, we go back and we scan everything we've ever gotten from a company going back to the first day they were onboarded with our, with our platform. And so what we're able to do at that point is we're able to identify threats even after they've been gone. There's no opportunity to hide because we just collect everything. And if the attacker doesn't know what we know because we're purely passive, we are always able to reinform and relearn and given new information. So, you know, in closing, I started with the end where I wanted people to think about the idea of evasion resistant security architecture, where it's systems that you cannot take and reverse engineer and study and learn how to evade. I like to think about ourselves as a vacuum cleaner. We want to collect everything. There's no this dust, but not that dust. No, we're just taking everything and we're going to do all of that analysis with it offline, out of band, with no feedback loop to an adversary. And as you think about what that means with AI powered cyber resiliency, the more unique something is, if someone generates some AI malware that's unique, it stands out because it's not conforming to what everything else does. So you're looking for the deviations, you're looking for those things that break around it. And that's a way to start thinking about security that becomes much harder for even the world's most sophisticated adversaries to try and work around because they don't know what we're doing with it. In fact, the only person who knows is us and our customer. And that's actually a pretty unique aspect of that. So I actually think the, the future for, for cybersecurity is bright. Um, it doesn't need to be dark. We don't need to push boulders up hills. We don't need to struggle with that anymore. I think that there's actually a way forward that gives us a lot more optimism and a lot uh, a better path to resilience, a better chance to you know protect ourselves and bounce back if we ever do get knocked down. So, yeah, thank you very much. And if there's any questions, I'll be happy to take some. Okay.